Alright, we're going to read chapter 2 of White Stallions of Lithiza by Marguerite Henry, illustrated by Wesley Dennis. Chapter 2. Oh, I forgot to show the last pictures from chapter 1. So here is Hans and his family in the bakery. And now chapter 2. Only a shilling. Hans's bedroom was on the second floor above the kitchen. Depending on the hour, he could smell sugar browning, butter melting, almonds toasting, goulash simmering, coffee brewing. He was used to all these smells, which told him the time of day. The room measured only eight feet by ten, but he liked it because it was all his. Once he had shared it with his sister, but since she had married a French baker and gone to Paris to live, he could sleep in her nice feather bed, and his old cot was stored among the flower sacks in the attic. The walls of his room were painted a color that was neither yellow nor brown, but a dull buff tone. Just let me catch you pinning white horses on this nice clean wall and aisle. His mother never quite said what the punishment would be, but the warning was enough. And so all that beautiful empty space went to waste. However, before she left, his sister, who was very pretty, had purchased an enormous mirror that covered almost half of one wall. Hans had poked fun of it at the time, but now it made a neat bulletin board. He had transformed it with pictures of lip pens and errs. Some of the pictures were from the newspaper, but these were not nearly so exciting as the colored ones from magazines. He had an arrangement with the news vendor near the Hofburg to sell him rain or snow-damaged copies for a groschen apiece. Eagerly, he brought them home and dried them on top of the oven. Once they were dry, he cut out each picture, picture carefully erased the dirt, and with his mother's flat iron, smoothed out the creases. Then he pasted the pictures up on his mirror. Now, when he awoke each morning, he was, for an instant, in the great riding hall, in a box seat, mind you, clapping in wild delight at horses leaping, horses rearing, horses dancing. And he saw the performance in all its glory. Then, in the midst of his dream, his mother's voice shrilled up the stairs. Hans! But late in the day, back home after school, he had only to cross the threshold to pick up the dream again. Hans's schoolfellows regarded the collection with indifference as something remote from their lives. They talked of soccer and sailing on the old Danube and bicycling on the Vienna forests and hunting deer and hare in the mountains. Hans listened politely, then sooner or later he brought the talk around to the lip hands and theirs. But on Less at the same time he could offer warm pastries from the kitchen and hot chocolate with dollops of whipped cream, his friends found excuses to go home. Hans felt himself an outsider then. He could not join in their interests, nor they in his. No one but Rosie shared his enchantment with the white stallions. As the brief morning meetings with the horses went on, Hans's curiosity mounted to the bursting point. Suddenly, the not knowing what took place in the riding hall became intolerable. He committed himself to a bold purpose. He would no longer use the money he earned doing odd jobs at the coffee houses to buy his own clothes. His mother was good at sewing. He would swallow his pride and wear his father's hand-me-downs. With the money saved, he could afford a ticket to the Sunday ballet. Let him do it, Papa, his mother urged one evening as she sat weaving a patch onto the seat of his school trousers. Let him get this foolishness out of his head. Once seen, soonest forgotten, I say. Hans warmed to her generosity. He leaned over and planted a kiss on the back of her neck so that she couldn't reach around and hug him. Sure, Mama, that's all I want to do. I just want to see how they get those horses to leap and dance and do the things they, that seem so unnatural. Maybe, he added, I could even try out what I learn on Rosie. His father looked troubled, but he did not object. The next morning when Hans had finished his deliveries and was on his way home, the policeman on the Joffsplatz agreed to watch Rosie while Hans went into the visitor's entrance of the palace to inquire the cost of tickets. So here he is dreaming of the horses and there's his mirror that he uses like a bulletin board. And over here is his mama. She is patching up his dad's clothes or his clothes. Facing the massive door, Hans paused, almost afraid to enter. A well-dressed man stepped in front of him and pushed it open. With a nod and a smile, he waved the boy inside. Hans stared at the businesslike look of the place. A wide aisle led directly to an enormous glass-enclosed office, and within it were a dozen or more girls busy at their typewriters. Clutching his cap as if it might fly away, Hans approached the one open window. In awkward silence, he stood waiting for someone to notice him. At last, a girl with glinty red hair came over to the window. Yes? She raised a question mark with her eyebrows. 
In his best manner, Hans had been rehearsing what to ask and how to ask it. Now he winced and dropped his cap, and in picking it up, stepped on the bright shoe shine of the man behind him. Oh, please excuse, he stammered. The girl tried to conceal her amusement. Come now, young boy, did you want a ticket for some Sunday performance, perhaps? Um, why, yes, Hans said in astonishment. The girl had read his mind. That is, no, ugh, I came to ask only how much is the cost. It all depends. The court loge, first row, would be twenty shilling. The first gallery, length side, is only five shilling. Five shilling? But of course, even so, we have no seats left for three months ahead. Hans started to turn away when the girl spoke again. Why don't you just queue up, young man, and buy standing room in the second gallery? You can see as well from there. Some think better. Then you just pay as you enter. Hans took new courage. How much is standing room? Only a shilling. But you must come very early. Even at 6.30 in the morning, the line begins. The boy thought this over, a fresh new hope rising in him. One shilling he could save. He heard the man behind him cough <coughs> politely and felt the nudge of an overcoat. Hans turned and smiled up at him. Then he ran down the corridor and out into the sunshine. He thanked his friend, the policeman, climbed up onto his seat in the bakery wagon and clucked to Rosie. Traffic shot past them as she clip-clocked along the way home. Hans let the reins fall loose. He was figuring how long it would take before he could do as the girl said. Just queue up and buy room in the gallery. In three weeks, he could do it. Why had he not thought of it sooner? And that is the end of chapter two.